Welcome to the School of Information. For those of you, those of you who are visiting, um, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, David Iman Shama, who has been working at Yahoo Labs for the past nine years, <laughs> as a senior research manager for the HCI research group. Um, he's been doing some really fascinating mixed methods research over all of these years looking at um, uh, multimedia HCI, uh, understanding social behaviors around shared media use. Um, he has many publications. Also this morning I learned that he was a visiting researcher at the NASA Ames lab working on the Mars rover project, which is a really interesting a bit of ago. your <laughs> research history. Um, and he'll be presenting today that the title is Social Information Organization and Interaction, which varies a little from the title we have up on our website. This is nice and simple and sweet. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so um, I changed the title a bit. The talk should still basically be the same, but uh, I was working on this, and this is where I settled at about, well, this time yesterday. So, <laughs> um, so I want to start off with... Um, if I can click. Great. I want to start off with this quote, and it's a quote by Marcel Duchamp. Uh, it's the creative act is not performed by the artist alone. And I want to just put that in your head right now, just chew on it for just a moment, and we're going to come back to it later. But it's something that I've been thinking about um, as we go through this work. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of information about what I've done because I've done a few things. So. Really quickly, uh, in grad school, I was looking at um, performance and communities online and AI and information systems, which led to uh, coming to Yahoo, where I started looking at deep media annotation, uh, thinking about can we have long pieces of video and have time tag comment across this video. It turns out that that's really hard and nobody really, really wants to do it. Uh, and at the same time, Twitter was becoming a thing, and people were tweeting while they were watching TV. And I was like, oh, that's kind of like an indirect annotation. So can we call all those tweets together and reify it against a piece of media which is um, yet to properly exist in the world, because it's happening right now. <laughs> and we were able to do some fun stuff like automatic segmentation and summarization using community signals. And that was really cool. Uh, and of course, sentiment as well. So we looked at debates, and we just realized that it doesn't matter who you're rooting for. Everyone's always negative. <laughs> um, started looking at um, instant messaging and sharing video in synchronous context. Actually, Yuming did some work with this uh, back in the day on this as well. Uh, and that led to, quite weirdly enough, doing some work on protocols for second screen interaction with TV and devices, um, which, for some reason or another, led to me being at Flickr. <laughs> strange little arc, but <laughs> that's how that all went together. Um, so at Flickr uh, is when I started uh, the HCI research group, and we started thinking about social computing and social media and people and interactions more broadly. Um, but with, with Flickr itself, because I like photography a lot, I was curious about this act of photography and what everyone is looking through for multimedia and image processing and social, social photography. No one was really going back to actually core photography itself, except for some good work from like Nancy and others. Uh, this is my quote. I don't know why <laughs> quotes around it. <laughs> so I actually want to talk a little bit about this, and I'm going to talk to two sort of points of this talk, right? And the first thing is going to be about photo editorial for weather news, a very concrete end-to-end -end thing we did. Uh, and the second thing is going to be something I've been noodling over, which is what I'm calling the new practice of old photography. I'm not really sure how that's going to work together yet. If you have a pressing question, you can shout it out. That's fine. Great. <clears throat> so part one. So there's this thing called Yahoo Project Weather. Um, it's kind of neat. There's a, a group on Flickr, and people can add their photos to this group. And editors go through, and they will add some extra annotations, such that if you're in Singapore, and it's night, and it's 26 degrees, uh, Celsius, then you can get a photo that matches those conditions, right? Uh, Chicago, San Francisco, a bunch of photos from around the world. And editors were going through 
curating these photos that were being added to the group. Editors were also going through Flickr to find photos and invite them into the group. Right? So this was the process. Now it turns out that there are some things the editors didn't want, right? Like things that would generally interrupt the visual aesthetic of what the app was trying to render on the phone. Right? And so these are like clearly identified by three things to the um, it was like watermarks, strange borders, and uh, people. Um, there's, there's a bunch of like international law around people. And so it was OK if it was a pedestrian that you couldn't see the face, then th that was fine. But then so it was, people was a bit weird, right? OK, so, so this is what they came to us with. And I have this up here. This is supposed to be a corporate and boring exercise, right? Can you find pedestrians, borders, and watermarks in photos using computer vision? Okay, and so we're like, okay, sure, we'll we'll take a look at this, and we kind of like entered this problem space here. All right, uh, so we did that. We built some detectors, and we took the tools to the editors, and and this is what we saw when we went to the editors. Right, they had these massive spreadsheets in Google Docs, and this is actually a clip from one of them, uh, and they had a bunch of URLs from groups that they were um, trolling on Flickr. Um, actually, trolling has a negative connotation. I mean, <laughs> a phishing connotation. <laughs> um, and uh, here's the group names. And they're kind of going through these sort of manually, this team of editors. Uh, and it's a very strange task. And what's interesting is they, when the photos that they liked, they saw them needed some adjustment to the metadata. They had some notation here in another spreadsheet. And this is a whole bunch of editors doing this across shared data. We saw some Google Docs that they were tracking through. And there was comments like this, left up on page three, fourth photo, lightning by an editor puts uh, his or her initials. And this is like, you know, when you add photos to a group, everything kind of paginates forward. And so this is not a method of tracking where you are in a group. But this is what, what they had to do. They were trying to go through it. So they had a really hard task. And we were seeing this as we were showing them the tools they asked us to build to help them with this task. And so we realized that, yeah, borders and watermarks is a problem. There's a bigger editorial problem here, right? And so we were curious, oh, well, let's actually take a look. Let's really start to look at what the editors were doing. OK, so <clears throat> this wasn't a um, hard piece of ethnographic research that you would sort of structure, but this was actually just us sitting with them and seeing what was going on as we tried to decipher this problem. We noticed a couple of things. One, editors were monitoring these groups they liked, right? Uh, and that was evident in that list of, uh, from the spreadsheet. And they would, they would, they would like favorite a photo, right? Favorite, 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 favorite. And this was a way of bookmarking. And they'd know we had to come back later. So they can troll through a lot of photos really quickly. I should quit using the word troll. <laughs> and then, and then uh, star the ones they like. And then later on, go back through and triage, right? Um, if they found a photographer that they liked a lot, they would actually go to that photographer's page of favorites. When you favorite something on Flickr, that favorite is, is public. You can see a list of everyone's favorites, much like Pinterest, like a single Pinterest board. And so they would actually find a photographer, uh, go to their favorites, and start looking for other favorites. This was interesting because this is a bad example that I took a screenshot of last night, but. Um, Photographers who like to take photos of weather will find other photographers that like to take photos of weather, and they will favor it a lot. So they're looking for that signal. <laughs> and there was also a disconnect between the um, engineers and the editors, and I'm not going to dive into it so much, but this was actually an interesting one. Um, if I were to like summarize it, everyone tries to take photos of lightning. <laughs> everyone takes photos of sunsets. And most of the photos of lightnings and sunsets are really, really crappy. <laughs> really hard to get these things right. The lighting and conditions are just impossible. All right? And so while an engineering approach that we heard from the engineers was like, oh, well, let's just find all the photos of lightning and we'll hand those to the editors. And the editors were like, that's not going to work. We actually were looking for a certain thing, a certain aesthetic. right? And so they wanted to actually always be careful of how thing placement is going to happen, how quality is to be represented. And quality is kind of a weird, fuzzy thing, especially if 
you're the one photo somewhere in rural Wyoming for that location, they probably want to take that photo. But if it's in San Francisco where they have 10,000 photos already, they don't want that photo. Right? And so there's a lot of these things that could be modeled as well. OK. <clears throat> so we start with them. And we look at their ingestion pool. It's about 47,000 photos that they have pending secondary editorial. They've favorited them and put them into a pool. And they need to be moved through each photo one by one to, to see what's happening. Right? So this is where we started. Now, um, I'm going to take a little bit of a side to kind of explain a, a couple of methods here. Um, and one, I'm going to talk about finding community. Right? Now, they had a set of groups that they liked and they're moving through them. We started this investigation um, not particularly on the groups just yet, but think about that action of favoriting. We we're curious how that signal actually worked. Right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, for this example here, we took a random set, I think about 100,000 people, maybe 50,000, somewhere there, and we got a set of their favorites, and we started looking at them. Okay? There's a bunch of photos. Right? Of course, there's people, and these people are quite simply, they're favoring the photos. Okay? These people are not necessarily socially connected, and for the most part of this network, they're not socially connected. Um, and so this is what we had. We said, let's take that photo, let's remove it. So that photo is the boundary between a shared action between two people. Right? So we remove that photo, we get this sort of implied connection. Person one and person three both save the, sa fave the same photo. So we're going to actually cause that. We're going to just impose a link there. We have this nice little network structure. We can reorganize it a little bit. Now it kind of looks like a social graph, as we've seen them before. And there's a commonly known technique called clique percolation that we can look to sort of complete these broken edges and make these triangles and circular connections, right? <clears throat> and so we do that. We get this nice thing what we're calling community summarization, all right? That's the general flow. What happened is, with this sample that we did, found there are people out there doing nothing but searching for photos of squirrels and clicking favorite. <laughs> okay. Buses. People, this is favoriting buses. And we went, we looked at some of these, these people, and we go look at their favorite stream, and it's like literally 90% squirrels, <laughs> right? Or 70% buses, right? Um, we did actually go to the logs to see if they're searching or how they're discovering, and it was product of search. Um, but that was evident beforehand because uh, this here, that's a squirrel nebula, by the way. <laughs> this is called a sun squirrel in parts of the southern United States. So the keyword was actually returning back. And they were encountering these things that were squirrel-like, I suppose, <laughs> and still favoriting them in, in the sets. Okay? So this was actually really, really cool. And we were, we were really, really excited um, when this happened. Um, turns out that. Uh, not everyone is totally, you know, favoring just squirrels. And so we started to look at what are the sort of concepts and the intersection between concepts between people. And so we start to see things that, like, people taking photos of graffiti in New York tend to use Nikons or like things that have Nikons. Yeah, I know, Nancy, it's weird. <laughs> and then and this squirrel people are Nikons, but the uh, animal jumping is nature's cannons. We saw some interesting things happen, but... Basically, we, we saw some intersect, but not a lot. And that's what we were trying to get at. Okay. Um, this is an interesting graph, because we were trying to understand how big these communities are and what's the diameter. Uh, this really uh, told us that we need to hire an InfoViz person. <laughs> and so we just looked at a bar graph next. And then so we saw that communities end up being about a size 100, right? Not very many of these sort of implied uh, I say communities of interest. I, I don't, community is probably a bit tenuous word here. But these interest sets of people ended up being about 100. Very few of them were, were really, really large. OK. So we start to now see these, 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 these trends of photos. Now, <clears throat> not all these photos. By the way, we're only looking at that one action of favorites. We've done nothing else. We're not doing anything fancy just yet. No computer vision, no nothing like that. Just that one action of favorites, and these are the sets that are coming up. Not all of these photos actually have any metadata that's relevant to what's going on here, which was interesting. But we could take the set of all the photos and now construct a vector. We could get a, a weighted vector of here's actually what's being represented through the what has been tagged or annotated here. And so we're getting a, a bigger, more complete picture. 
these creepy dolls came up. <laughs> these are called Blythe dolls, and they're, they're, there's a strong community on Flickr that likes them a lot. Um, these kids came up. What's interesting is um, they are mostly using Instagram, about 40% of them, I think. And there's no tags on this at all. And this is actually a, a high school in, in, in Vietnam. Um, but so we can surface things with even weird signals or, or no real descriptive signals, but here's a set of people. All right, <clears throat> so we ran a little study, and um, I don't know how much I want to go into the study, but uh, this was a study we ran on Turk. We were curious, uh, Mechanical Turk, um, we were curious how cohesive are these sets, how um, diverse are they, and so forth. So we ran a little evaluation study. Um, and you know, this basically, it was, it was showing pretty positive. They're uh, more cohesive than random, uh, about as diverse as random, because you would assume random had diversity and so forth. Uh, but we started looking at, we asked the, the, the crowd workers to levy some labels on this. Um, and this was interesting. So we saw some profound shifts that I wanted to take a little aside and talk about really quickly. Uh, so first of all, like faces, sketches, portraits, versus drawing arts and paintings. So this auto and then Amazon Mechanical Turk. So stuff like graffiti and street art kind of worked out. Some stuff kind of didn't, right? When you had things that were solid, like trains or guns, people kind of got that. But there were some things that were just missing. And this is like, clearly the crowd workers are devoid of any context of why labels are attached to these images. So in this example here, uh, these are a bunch of screen grabs from Second Life of people's avatars. Again, it's something that a community likes to do. Uh, you show that to a Turker, they're just like uh, disconnected crowd workers, just oh, man, woman, uh, art, right? And so that gets to be kind of interesting. Um, the, oh, sorry, the car brands were really important to the community, but we didn't see that again in the Turkers. Uh, language problems or language disconnects, so it's something a lot in Spanish. Turkers aren't speaking Spanish. Um, they, uh, of course, they don't know what the Blythe dolls are, so they just call them dolls. And then they miscategorize Bratz dolls as Barbie dolls, which I would assume start a war somewhere if we did that publicly. <laughs> so, but this was, this is, this is, and I, I bring this up only to, to point out there's a problem with using crowd tools to evaluate community systems. And that's uh, something we're still trying to wrestle with. How do we do these evaluations um, given that problem? Um, generally, people, though, did agree with, uh, with what was happening with the matching here. Now, uh, I'll, I, every now and then, I'm going to throw in a quote from a photographer. Clyde Butcher is one of my favorites. Uh, and Clyde Butcher talks about uh, all he does is take photos of nature, particularly swamps, always in black and white. And it's something he's always doing, right? And he talks about he's pursuing it for a long time. And I see from a consumption, not from a creation aspect, but from a consumption aspect, we see people exhibiting the same behavior. They're looking for something. They're trying to curate something together to their liking. And that's what we're surfacing with this technique. Now, <clears throat> if you step back a moment, it's kind of, we, we saw this happening on Flickr already. The, the editors were looking at groups. There's a groups for every weird little thing. This is the one, actually, I like a lot. It's called One Car. Uh, if you see, uh, see uh, one car shots only. Anything creative is fine. One car only, no series shots. One car, no other cars, trucks, buses, or car-like creatures. One car, right? And that's the whole point with this group. They just want one car in the photo. They don't even care if it's a good photo. They just want one car. And this is actually really interesting. Uh, another one of my favorite groups is Stick Figures in Peril. So if you've, <laughs> if you've not seen it, you should totally do it. And please, when you travel around the world, take photos and, and submit them. OK. So we thought. Could we do this with this list of groups that the editors have? Right? And so we were kind of excited about this. Um, now, the question is, how do we do this? We could take all the photos and take all the favorites that are on those photos and start to do this clique percolation. Uh, we actually uh, had another piece of technology that we sort of refactored into this, which would work more broadly. And that was the thing. The question now became, are people's viewing patterns also indicative of this? Or is it just their favoriting patterns, right? And so for this, we actually build a, uh, we take all these groups, take all the, all the viewing patterns that uh, everyone has done across these groups. Everyone's anonymously scrubbed out already, but we just know 
person A viewed these photos, person B viewed these photos. We don't know who they are. And so we build a giant Markov network looking for the probability of a photo being interesting based on how close it is to these groups. Yeah, those groups. OK, so we do this, and we go from there are 47,000 groups waiting, uh, 47,000 photos waiting to ingest to 16.1 million photos. <laughs> or no, 16, 6.1 million photos, sorry. Right? So now we've actually we've, we've, we've looked at the viewing patterns. We've expanded out based on what the editors were doing themselves, looking at these groups and the traffic around these groups. They weren't looking at the viewing patterns, but we thought we could find stuff that wasn't in the groups by doing that because people are searching for information. People are searching for photos. And so we had 6.1 million. Now, that's a lot of photos. Um, and even we thought there were a lot of photos. And even we knew that they're not all going to be right. Okay. So the question was, what are the problems? Okay. So we take a sample, and we made this little sheet, and we handed the sample to the editors. And we said, hey, just if you like it, mark it here. Otherwise, you know, tell us what's wrong. Right? And so they start telling us problems in the set. This is interesting. It's a watermark and borders come back up. Not about weather comes up. They don't want black and white photos. Too much HDR. They, so I guess they don't want the other way. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, sun flares. You know, the size is wrong. It's overexposed. Distracting foreground. Bad crop and so forth. Right? So some of these things now, we can say, oh, there's easy things we can just search for. The aspect ratio or the resolution or the geo accuracy. We can just pull these out. So let's just pull them out, okay? We just pull them out, and we go from 6.1 million to about 1.3 million, which is still more manageable, but the editors were still like, uh, dude, <laughs> wait a minute. What's the error rate on that? <laughs> OK. Um, so we're not gonna now we're, we're now going to deal with the harder problems, right? like the weather conditions, the borders and watermarks, and the time of day. And I'm going to bring that back up later on in the talk. Great. So um, we decided now to look at computer vision. This is kind of late in the game, because we've gotten down to about a million images or so. So we're curious. Let's look at computer vision to see if we can find the right photos. This is something I actually like a lot here. Um, historically, I've spent a lot of my career arguing against the need for computer vision, which is why this is really odd that I'm talking about this is really important. Um, it wasn't that we wanted to find day photos or snowy photos or lightning photos. Right? That's one task in and of itself. However, we wanted photos that matched a certain aesthetic and a certain appearance. And so um, we used um, deep learning. We used something based on, probably was CAFE or based on CAFE, which comes from over there in CS. Standard deep learning computer vision approach, nothing particularly fancy. What's different is, we trained on the positive and negative examples that came from the editors themselves. Right? There's a community of editors, team of editors. They have positive and negative examples. And we're trying to classify lightning based on that. We're not trying to classify lightning broadly. right? Just here's a very specific sense of something, storm and night. right? Um, also, like the non-weather related indoors watermarks, classifying on that. And that actually gives a sort of slight but important tuning to what we're actually pulling out. Because we can throw out lightning photos. But we know that these lightning photos aren't indicative of the ones that have been selected in the past. And so, um, so we train the classifier that way. And we get down to just about uh, just under a million, which is great. Um, so we call this sort of broader context here. We're, 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 we're still toying with the name of it. Uh, but we're really sort of community supervised techniques, right? We're looking at how people are curating media themselves. These people are consumers on site. These people are just weather enthusiasts, or maybe photographers, maybe just maybe they're just favoriting things they've never uploaded a photo, right? We're looking at those signals first, and then we get a candidate set of images, and then we use judgments from editors to train the classification, right? And then we take that and we hand that, we do some cleanup, and we hand that back to the editors. For, for their ingest. Okay. Um, what's also interesting about this is that little um, note. People who tend to like view and like photos that have borders and huge watermarks tend to view and like photos that have borders and huge watermarks. People who don't like photos and, uh, with huge watermarks tend not to be in those sets. 
And so now we actually we removed a lot of the cases of borders and watermarks before we even got to the point of training against them because the community itself was just sort of leaning that way as people sort of categorized one way or the other. All right, so how do we evaluate this? You know, and this is, this is a, again, a big question. Um, generally, people look for these sort of benchmark data sets and they'll like to train against this and then show performance against that. And that's fine and dandy. It doesn't quite work for what we're, what we're looking for. Because it's, again, we wanted lightning photos that kind of look like these people would like them. And that's a weird evaluation. So we said, okay, let's just evaluate this. Let's just look at, the, let's just hand it to the editors. Let's evaluate how they're, how they're dealing with this, right? So we, from that uh, 0.9 million, we sampled about 500 images because uh, we only had about 10 editors and not a lot of their time to test something out with at this point. And so uh, we saw about 30% of the images were getting approved. And that's actually pretty good. The editors themselves were, were higher in their percentage when they were actually going through their approval by 50%. But you have to remember, they had already kind of pre-screened a lot of these images in the first place by favoriting them and then going back and revisiting. So they had a much, they had a two-phase two process. So it, I get it, it's not an apples to orange comparison, but if we actually take all the photos that an ever, editor would see on an average day and then add it in, the number drops from their, that 50% target, drops maybe around 10% or maybe a little less than that. Um, we noticed uh, with our system, editors, uh, with our pre, pre-screen system, editors could triage about 100 images per hour versus 12 we took them before. Right? I think there was a lot of, uh, we talked to the editors, there's a lot of guessing and positioning and reevaluation. And also it, part of it, they kind of trusted these images better because they knew the computer checked for silly things like resolution, where before they'd have to go through a very complex tool. Their tool actually wasn't actually designed to handle a lot of images because again, we took them from 47,000 to just about a million and now when we handed them too many images, uh, that became a problem and we have to start rethinking what's the tools that they're gonna use and how are they supposed to consume images in this way for, for the app. So <coughs> this, is, um, this is akin to some older work from William Clancy from 1995, who I know from working at NASA back in the day um, and around human-centered computing. And I, you know, quite honestly, I'm not sure what that term means now, which is why I'm very, very clearly saying it's about how Clancy positioned it in 1995. And that was a, an engineering method or methodology that could look at how people are working in a space and then build engineering systems around it to help them do that job. There's a bunch of different terms for this from uh, amplified intelligence to cognitive orthotics. And we can talk about everyone in their different terms for it. But really the idea was we wanted to help the editors do what they need to do better than they could do it, better than humanly possible. Because they can't go through that many images that fast. So we wanted to model how their practice was happening and bring that into the tool. They were also, if you like, want to play the other card and say, well, couldn't you just build a computer vision system or a voice that just did this all automatically? And that was something that they were just always a little concerned about for a lot of judgment regions. It wasn't necessarily that they thought we're, you know, it's not the robots will take our jobs and then destroy the planet. It was more so around the aesthetic judgments and the variability of those aesthetic judgments are hard to capture and we agree that they're hard to capture at this moment. So we we're trying to build a system to help them out. Any questions about this before I move on to part two? All right, so part two, the new practice of old photography. <laughs> um, so that was a very applied um, piece of work, had some research insights in it, uh, had some clear business deliverables and some you know, efficacy towards the company or company broadly speaking. Uh, and that's great, it's fun, get to work on those problems. But actually there's other problems that are driving a lot of this. There's larger questions and so this is now get a look at some of those questions. I'm going to start off with geo-referenced photos. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was not quoted um, intentionally in a, in a magazine article once where I said, um, if I see another map with pin drops where my friends are, I'm going to puke. That was, <laughs> that was my quote from several years ago. And so I've always had this like interest, interest in geo because I don't know exactly how to do it right. 
And I think it's a big problem. As no one could argue against that because you can get a whole PhD in it, right? So I've always toyed with it every now and then. This is about geo-referenced photos and particularly points of interest. Does anyone know where this photo was taken? Amsterdam. Yeah. It's a bus stop. Yeah. It's just a fun placing task I like to do in the talk. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so what we start thinking about is these points of interest. Think about all the cameras that are about. Tons of cameras everywhere. Shot from SF Bat Kid. Uh, cameras are these things that we have. Mine's currently acting as a remote for my talk, but they have cameras in them, and there's a lot of data in there, right? And we were looking at it, and it turns out that we, if we can understand where people are and how they're taking photos, can we find points of interest in the world? Not only the known ones, because it it's not hard to tell me that that's the Great Pyramid of Giza, but other points of interest that are happening across everyone taking photos all the time. And the GPS was sort of promise. It's this thing that was going to save us. It's kind of akin to like flying cars in the year 2000. It's like not really happening, right? But these, these, these phones now, actually, they have compass information as well, which is where we started this investigation. We know the camera's pointing somewhere. But again, it doesn't save us, because if everyone took photos like you see over on your left, um, then it would be fine. We could just get all the points get all the compass directions, do an averaging, and say, here's where things are happening, right? Turns out it's more like on the right, okay? If I give you a real world example and a bad visualization, it looks like this, okay? <laughs> this is Horseshoe Falls, uh, represented by the uh, green square, and then these uh, two different colors are um, different counts of individual photographers and where they were generally pointed when they were taking photos. I think the, um, the blue ones are five or more, and then the uh, other ones are five or less. Right? It's kind of a mess, right? And so we were hoping, could we do better than this? So we needed some ground truth. We needed something to understand how our photo is being taken. So we got a list of points of interest from around the world, and we started with that. Right? So we have the Sydney Opera House, and we know that people generally take pictures of it at a certain distance and at a certain direction. Right? So, from there, we can do something really, really nice. We can start to think of the throw of the average cameras at that point, right? Um, and now, by the way, you have to correct by device for true north versus magnetic north, which is not fun, because that took a long time going through every device we had to figure out what's being returned. But basically, we can get, it, we can get a throw for any point of interest. Uh, and then if we have... Um, a bunch of people, and this is, we want to, at least five individual photographers. We don't want five photos, we want five photographers who've been there to, take it, to, to do this math, right? Uh, and then we basically um, Gaussian blur it and so, until we get a heat map region. And so we start to get these, what I think are really, really pretty pictures of points of interest from around the world. Uh, and so we can see there's the point of focus, there's the center of the photographers, and that's five or more photographers, there's the green dots, okay? And this is actually what the Taj Mahal looks like when we do this map. Now, bear with me, because I know what you're thinking. Here's another one that's uh, poorly cropped, and this is the Washington Monument. And you might be saying, hey, Iman, everything's lining up. And it's like, yeah, because you know what? The landscape of these, of these places make you stand there. I mean, actually, this is a good question to ask. Who's been to the Taj Mahal? Who's taken this photo? <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> you, it's what you do. It's, it's kind of what you do. All right, so the universe is complex, and so now this is what the universe is complex looks like, okay? And so now, again, we see um, where the center of the photographers are, where the point of interest is. You actually see the point of aim now is off, right? Uh, and this is actually Horseshoe Falls. Um, one more example, and this is Sutro Tower. Um, and you can't quite see it in the projection, but that's actually where the tower is, and that's actually where the photographers are pointed, right? So when we were doing this work, um, the uh, scientist I was working with came to me with a bunch of these printouts, and he was distraught. He was like, it's, it's working in some of the cases, and it's not working in some of the cases. I don't know how to correct it when it's not working. He walked me through all this, and I was like, oh, wait, you know, this is, we're kind of surfacing the rule of thirds in photography, where you're going to align something up. And there's a whole bunch of arguments around, is it a natural aesthetic alignment or not? 
don't know. Maybe you're just trying to fit two people in the frame or the person and the, and the tower. Not sure, but we're, this is what we're surfacing. So anywhere where the landscape didn't show, didn't make you take that one point perspective, we saw this offset. Um, this just basically says our method does better than averaging, which you'd be expecting. And a uh, common criticism is, so what are you trying to do? Tell people where to, how to take photos. You're just stifling creativity. And just preemptively, I'm going to tell you, we've been doing this for a very long time. This is where we tell people to take photos. This is the Vista point. Take your photo here. And even Adams um, would hike up into uh, the Grand Tetons and Yellow Snake River and take a photo. And then it would go to National Geographic. And the people went to the park and said, didn't look like that. And so park services started changing how they curated their trails so people could get the same shots. All right, and so now here's a really bad projection. Um, I don't know if that's going to work. It's better. Good. Um, and so now we can start to look at areas of the world. This is Paris. Um, and we can start to wonder what's happening in these other parts. What it was trying to do is surface things we didn't know about. And so that's now where we're, we're thinking about. And I'm going to get back to that in a moment. Invert the screen. It can get a little trick. All right. So now, next thing we talk about is editing. All right. And this is actually really cool. Um, Cartier Brisson, uh, old photographer, father of photojournalism, has this beautiful quote that uh, he doesn't care about editing. He doesn't like to edit. And those hunters, after all, aren't cooks, which I think is brilliant. Uh, and I, I totally disagree with him. Um, but that's why that's there. Okay, so we now edit, and we actually edit inside our devices, which is really kind of interesting to me. Right? This phenomenon of filtering, it's basically I capture, I edit, and I, set, and I share. It's really, really interesting. What was once a heavyweight operation is getting lighter and lighter. Photography is getting really easier. Uh, and again, new practice of old photography. This has been happening for a long time. We've been trying to make photography easier. The brownie was the iPhone of its time. You carry it anywhere you go. Look, it's got a handle. <laughs> Just carry it around. I found this old ad. It was I love it because it's like anyone can use it. No knowledge of photography is necessary. I still don't know what a hundred instantaneous pictures means. <laughs> and this is from uh, 1888. So it's like okay. So our question is a little bit more sophisticated than that. We want to know that when I edit and share, how does that change the engagement the photo might get? How does it change the conversation? Right, and that's um going to be I'm a little bit out of step, but that's OK. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of photos on Flickr that were either uploaded from Instagram and cross-posted or from the Flickr app itself. They have filters on them. We can determine that from the metadata. And then we're going to do some computer vision. That's kind of our flow here, right? And we want to measure engagement. Right? We're going to call engagement uh, the views, the favorites, and the comments that the photo will receive. And that's what we're calling engagement, some, some function therein. All right? Not a lot of photos, 3 million. Uh, corresponding metadata, users' data, all public photos. And we say corresponding vision tags. So we, again, computer, using some computer vision, we want to figure out what's happening in these photos. Right? And we have a bunch of binary classifiers, and we just kind of like lump a bunch of them together. Like there's photos that are kind of nature-y, flowers and bees and mountains. And those are three different binary classifiers. We're just kind of lumping them together, OK? Uh, photos with people, photos with text, photos of things. Uh, I actually wanted to do just food by itself, but there wasn't enough food in the sample to make that work. So we just lumped that together with things. Uh, photos at night. And then we wonder what can actually affect the engagement, right? If I put a tag, Berkeley High School, on my photo, People search for Berkeley High School. That's going to make somebody see the photo when they search for it. So we know that's actually something that's going to affect the engagement. We want to actually control for these things. All right? So tags, photo screen views, uh, followers, and so on. Um, we looked at these variables. And basically, they're all count variables overly dispersed uh, by what we're trying to predict on, which is views, comments, and favorites. And so this just kind of spelled out to choose a negative binomial, which kind of looks like this. And the important thing to measure is this is some function of engagement um, that's going to account for those controls, but then also account for was the photo filter, what's the content of the photo, was it taken at night, and then filter by content and filter by night. 
Um, model works. I just want to get to results here. Okay. And so this is looking at the, uh, the, the magnitude of the beta coefficients, because you shouldn't look at p-values for this sort of thing. Uh, and so we see here's our control effects. Tags had no real effect. But of course, if I had a lot of followers, I get a lot of views. So we know that. That's why we're controlling for it. We have some things with small significant coefficients and p-values, uh, like text and so forth. So we can throw all those out. I'm just going to talk about this right here. I'm going to walk you through this really quick. Great. So just filtering it statistically increases the chance of engagement. Something we just saw across the board. Okay. Now, <laughs> if you take a nature photo, you won't get a lot of comments on it, but you'll probably get a lot of favorites and a lot of views. Filtering it, you're going to drop your chances of that. Right? So there's something about the community that's on Flickr and how it behaves and reacts to nature photos. They want to see them you know, unedited. They want nature as it is. People, people like people. It doesn't matter if they're filtered or not. Um, things, nobody cares about the lunch you had at all. <laughs> Sorry, if you filter it, people will care a little bit more. <laughs> so we started looking at a couple of fa uh, 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 factors here about the content and the active filtering, the active engagement. What kind of filter is is another question we're starting to look at. Um, we're still new in this. There's two papers out on this so far. We're still new in this space. So we're sort of expanding out. Now, um, this is questions that I have, not questions for you guys to ask. So <laughs> great. So one thing that comes up a lot is volume. Um, you know, we have a lot of devices all around us that are always taking photos. And we're really curious about that. From selfies to like, that thing's called a narrative clip. You like put it here and walk around and it takes a photo every 30 seconds. I don't know what you do with it afterwards, but it's a $100 device if you care to have such a walking history of your life. Uh, you know, street view cameras and other things. So many photos out there. And um, the volume is just getting larger and larger and larger. Uh, there was an estimate that said 10% of all photos were taken in the last 12 months. And that back of the envelope calculation was made in 2011. And so it's kind of nuts. Right? So one thing we did is we. Uh, we being myself and someone on my team got together and we called together 100 million Creative Commons photos and made a data set, a uniform data set for everyone to look at and do research against. You can go download uh, all the metadata around it. It's about 12 gigabytes. You can download the pre-generated computer vision features around it, uh, which Lawrence Livermore is graciously hosting for us. Um, and so this was a, a sort of outreach step. Um, it's been really well received. In the six months, the, it's been downloaded over 700 times, I think, so far, which is like now our most popular data set. Um, but what was interesting is we get a lot of interesting feedback from the community. Some, most people are really happy, really excited that we're sharing data, having a uniform set that people can go grab and do research against. And a lot of people are like, are there, are, are there, is there ground truth? Are these things labeled? And we're like, no, they're not. <laughs> They're like, well, I can't use it if it's not labeled. It's not, there's no ground truth set. I'm like, you know, and, and this was a friend of mine, and I was like, you've been asking for real world data for the last two years from me. Now I hand you a bunch of real world data, and you tell me it's useless. This is actually the problem. <laughs> Figuring out how do we do these, how do we understand the stories here? How do we understand the ground truths? And so it's hope, we're hopefully going to expand out this dialogue and by sharing this data set, have more and more people contribute. And it's already started to happen. We've already seen people are telling us they have papers under publication that they're going to add other feature sets to or ground truths to do science against. It's really awesome. OK. Back on the point of maps. Um, I had um, a wonderful uh, opportunity last summer, no, last winter, to take a sabbatical from Yahoo. And I was at the National University of Singapore. Um, while I was there working on ubiquitous technologies and stuff, uh, I was curious about Singapore itself because I had only been there once for a conference and I always found myself living there. Um, so I called a sample of geotag photos taken around the island, mapped them poorly <laughs> to take a look, and I was like, oh, okay, I don't know how to put points on a map. <laughs> and so that's where I started. 
I was like, OK, well, let's, what am I trying to see? I want to find out what's the most popular area. So I did a little command line foo. And like I said, OK, look, hey, here's, here's actually 21,000 photos taken at a long lap point. Right? So then I go back. I figure out how to make a better map with kernel density. It looks cooler, but still equally useless. But, um, but that's basically the spot that I was just highlighting to you. Who here has been to Singapore? OK, great. Uh, who here knows what's there? Okay, you, you, okay, hold on to it. <laughs> so I went, I looked around and I thought everywhere I was going. <laughs> and I'm not really sure. So do you know what's there? <laughs> okay, three reservoirs. That's the best, that's the best answer I've gotten so far. And it's completely wrong, OK? So, <laughs> but thank you. That's actually really good. So I went to Google Street View. And this is the exact long lat coordinate in Google Street View. <laughs> Historic picturesque Upper Thompson Road <laughs> is where that comes to. And I was just like, this, what's going on here? What's up with this long lat coordinate by the country club, but kind of in the road? right? And I just couldn't figure it out. And at some point, I think I was in a conversation with Brent Hecht. Uh, at University of Minnesota, and we realized that this is the center of the bounding box of Singapore. <laughs> so if you have some kind of geofence or geo privacy set up to say only allow a certain resolution to be geotagged, then we store that. That gets stored. Foursquare does it. Everyone does this, right? Now, problematically in Singapore, the city and the country <laughs> are the same thing. And so if you have anything set as far as geo privacy beyond the neighborhood level, it just becomes Singapore. And then when you ask a computer, what long lat was this thing taken out of, it returns the center of that bounding box and hands it to you. Right? So I'm like, man, I hate it when data lies to me. But I'm always really happy when I find out it's lying. But this is actually a, a larger problem, because it turns out, as computer scientists, we love rectangles, because they're really easy to represent. Just a couple coordinates, bing, 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 and that's what we do. And we do this shamelessly across a lot of geodata. Right? And there are, there are better shape maps in the world and so forth, but this is something that recurs over and over again. Right? And so this is understanding data representations and how they manifest in the world. Again, what we're trying to do is produce more interesting maps of spaces, which is why I started this experiment. Um, this is uh, an example of proof that I need to hire a designer <laughs> because this font is horrible. But we're looking at tag regions. So basically, can we look at where a tag is used? In this case, it's Paris. Look at where a tag is used in every tag on Flickr in an area on public photos. And then can we simplify that? Because this is too noisy on one side. We want to know where the river district is, or where, where are people taking photos of the river? Where are people taking photos of graffiti or their coffee? Where are they taking photos of those photos? Um, this is just kind of how we did it. Uh, so we basically assume this complicated tag region is a point map. Again, blur it, and then look for areas that have some sort of rough regional calculus so we can understand that simplification. But then I got really upset because I'm, I'm drawing lines on a map. And a lot of problems in the universe has happened because people just start drawing lines on maps. <laughs> and I was like, what's going on here? I don't know. And so I started talking with some people. And I actually went to chat at this point with some engineers at Flickr uh, who'd been around for a while. And they, they brought up an interesting point. And this is the work of Eric Gelinas, uh, the example of Eric Gelinas, who is now at Stamen Design. <coughs> um, in San Francisco, I live in Noe Valley. And then there's the Mission, and then there's Bernal Heights. So if you're standing where that red dot is, and the computer wants to reverse geocode where you are, where are you standing? And people get like really crazy. Oh, it's Outer Mission. And someone's like, no, that's not Outer Mission. That's further down. Someone's like, it's like the Baha Noe yeah, that comes up, right? All of these things come up, right? And it's a hard problem because, again, we like our rectangles, and we like to know exactly where we are. And we assume there's no overlap in the universe, of course. And so this becomes hard. Now, this is actually a problem. And this is actually why I really love looking at community. This is now we're up at the top of Bernal Hill looking down on that area. Okay, and This is a true story. You can check the URL. Okay, One day, I think in 2008, this man who goes by the name Burrito Justice, 
who believes every man, woman, and child on the planet should be given a burrito, who lives in that area of town, decided that we should just end this problem. And he gave it a name, and he called it la lengua, which is Spanish for the tongue, because he said it, it makes like a, like a tongue coming out of what he called hipster Valencia, right? <laughs> okay? And there's also nothing but burrito joints, you know, Taqueria, Cancun, whatnot, on that stretch. And so he was very excited. He posts on his blog, hey, don't call it Baja Noe, don't call it Outer Mission, call it La Lengua. And if something asks you, geocode something, and go change it. And Flickr lets you edit the geocode. So like Flickr would say, you're in Baja Noe. He told people to go and edit it and change it. People change it to La Lengua. And everyone starts changing the lingua. Eventually, Flickr starts telling you, hey, that's the lingua. <laughs> Eventually, Flickr publishes its shape maps, open sources them. And then Google's like, we like maps. Foursquare's like, we like maps. Apple's like, we try to like maps. <laughs> and so they, they get the, the shape maps. And all of a sudden, Foursquare is thinking, hey, is this la lengua? Right? And it starts propagating. And um, Eric said the moment he saw a Craigslist ad for an apartment in La Lengua is from a real estate agent <laughs> is when he knew something had happened. <laughs> and this is really great. And I think there's uh, probably tons of these sort of community, community examples where meaning has been negotiated. This is one man living in San Francisco in, in 2008 who had enough sway to get, make something happen. And by consequence of us open sourcing data, it's sort of propagated very loudly, but I'm sure there's other examples out there. And these are things that, that I you know, really think we should be thinking about more when we, when we surface these and study these systems. Um, I'm still in my open question phase, so <laughs> excuse me while I finish. Memes, uh, I think memes are amazing. They're sort of temporal, but they're not. They kind of come back. Um, a lot of them are based off of, especially in photography, about some sort of suspension or some sort of breaking of reality. Uh, one way or another. Um, Brisson I like to refer to this as the decisive moment, um, but it's been happening for a long time. I'm really curious about how these trends move, though, and how people get and consume and then move on, and how they pass it on. We haven't really studied that well. Also, this idea of like what I create versus what I curate, something sort of we've been, from a research perspective, kind of addressing, but really haven't dove in and start to understand it. Right, what is the curation? How is curation happening today? And how is it different than what I create and, and my preferences? I have a whole problem on time and temporality. Um, Marty and I were talking about networks, and this is my part of my problem is temporality is just not really well asserted in social network analysis. But I'm actually going to talk about something a little bit different, something we like to call whose time is it anyways. Um, we started looking at a lot of data. This is what my camera generates for, uh, for EXIF, or some of it anyways. <clears throat> and so we started noticing there are so many timestamps on our media. There's the photo taken time. There's the photo uploaded time. There's the photo modified time. There's the photo replaced time. And that's what, what Flickr holds. But then the camera's like date and time modified, uh, date and time original, date and time digitized, GPS timestamp. Tons of timestamp, timestamps on media. So we started looking at them. Um, guess what? Uh, at least 40% of the GPS timestamps don't match the actual photo taken time by at least 10 minutes. All right? And in much cases, much as 12 hours in 10% of the cases from a sample of 10 million public photos. Right? Now, a lot of things happen. If you set your phone to your iPhone to uh, you take a photo in SFO, set it to airplane mode, go land in London, take a picture, it reports the last. Uh, GPS stamp, so it'll say San Francisco, right? With that timestamp that it thinks it was the cache timestamp. So there's some power saving and other device interactions happening here, um, but it causes this huge rift because we don't know when this photo was taken. Uh, I don't have a slide for this, and I'm sorry, um, but we thought, can we, uh, can we correct this? And so we came up with a method. We had an idea how we could use machine learning to look at all of these different timestamps and sort of correct it. And then the question became, where do we get ground truth? And um, uh, Bart uh, Tomei on my team was like, oh, well, we have a lot of pictures of clocks. Can we just look at the pictures of clocks? <laughs> so <laughs> we searched for photos of clocks. 
And the initial idea was to use computer vision to read the time on the clocks, but we ended up just hand coding uh, enough so we could build a classifier. And we can correct about 25% of the timestamps to match the clocks. Assuming that we, we tried to pick famous clocks like Big Ben so we could know that they were correct and not somebody in a broken clock shop taking pictures of clocks. Uh, but there was a paper at AC Multimedia in last year uh, about this. But this speaks to events, because we really want to start to reify what's happening. Look, can we look at the photo traces or the or plurality of sources and so across social media, start to understand when things are happening, where they're happening from by point of interest, where the cameras are pointed, and start to tell a larger story or a larger narrative. And this is kind of where we're going. And then lastly, on a kind of a different note, but back on the curation points, there's a lot of other information that's beyond these, these large data sets. Because right? like, if you want to go look at some, by the way, there's uh, 49 million geotagged photos in the data set that we released, which is a lot. It's probably the, one of the largest collections of geotagged uh, photos for, for open research. Right? But there's another side of this. And there's like, the Internet Archive, for example, has been book scanning for, since 2005. Um, sometime over the summer, they decided to crop out all the photos in these books and upload them to Flickr with a bunch of structured metadata. Um, uh, they started uploading on a Friday night, and by Saturday night, they'd uploaded 2.5 million photos, and so we kind of noticed because <laughs> the servers were kind of out of breath. <laughs> um, and so, and they have another 12 million to upload, by the way. This is a very strange collection. It's old, old photos with no known copyrights. Um, this is actually a, we had a beard classifier, so we were looking at beards throughout the ages. but. Um, the question is, how do you even start to enter an archive like this? How do you enter a library like this? How do you enter a collection beyond searching it? Just how do you start to consume it? And it's really, really hard. And we started a dialogue with them. At the same point, there's other, again, more types of images showing up in the world. There are people like the Smithsonian, uh, as well as Conservation International, putting camera trap, infrared camera traps around the world and collecting them. And then they get millions of photos, and they have problems, again, how do they triage them? How do they show them to scientists? How do they get the judgments? And in this case, there's extra information around their photos, like uh, not just time of day, but actually atmospheric conditions and other air quality and other sensors. And they're actually coming up with a, an ocean health index that they're trying to understand what's happening based on migratory patterns. So at the same time, we're looking at these large data sets for these like very common problems and quite compelling compute consumer experiences. There's a whole bunch of other work to happen that's a little bit more esoteric, but I think are going to be some of the problems we face with the collections we're making nowadays, because it, those things tend to get a little ignored because they're not the, the large drivers for, for companies. So I want to take you back to um, the quote, the creative act is not performed by the artist alone. The full quote says, the spectator brings the work into context with the external wor world. Right, which is, this is from Duchamp's um, On Ready Made's uh, paper. It's actually really interesting because he's stating that there's more to it than just that, that moment of capture. Right? There's something about consumption, there's something about sharing, something about communication, right? And that's the broader picture. And if there's one thing I can have you guys walk away with, it's try to find what that broader picture is because that's what I'm always trying to look for myself. And with that, I can take some questions and I want to thank a bunch of people who have worked on things throughout the years. Nancy. <laughs> so how did you deal with the problem and, and, and doing it you know, as automated as possible of the only picture that's the crappy picture somewhere out in the middle of Wyoming and finding that one, and especially if it wasn't geotagged? <clears throat> so, um, so first of all, if it's not geotagged, it gets rejected from that weather experiment. Or the weather project. They only want things that have. Do you have any textual descriptions? Can you say that? Textual, as in. So, if, so you can have the lat long, or you can have the person saying. Oh, right. They wanted, um, they wanted lat long. They wanted the geo stamp to be sent up with the photo. They didn't want somebody who went back and, and added it. 
Um, but there's weird paths that you know, right? So if I, if I geotagged it in Aperture, then cross-posted it to Flickr, then it comes with a long lat that way. But they were looking for the long lat with a certain accuracy. So that's what they're looking for. Um, the, the idea of targeting, we actually made some geographic explorers for them because sometimes they had a request to go fill an area. And so we built uh, some tools that would help them navigate to an arbitrary area on the planet and see if there was any photos that we had surfaced. Um, and then for the other side of it, um, that was an interesting editorial decision about like if they get that picture in Wyoming, do they actually want it? Do they want it? If, if one's in the pool, do they actually want to add it right now? And I think that was a business decision not to prioritize those, but give them their fair justice. So if they showed up in someone's stream, it was fine, but they weren't trying to surface and get coverage in remote locations. It was more data, actually it was more data driven. They were looking at where the app was being run and say, oh, if somebody in Wyoming, you know, 500 people in Wyoming downloaded the app and they're not getting photos, then they would go target. So it was, I think they were, they were taking more data driven approach. So if the images have to have lat long, that would bias your sample in favor of camera phone images. What effect would that have, if any? They were very happy about that, <laughs> quite honestly, uh, because it's the idea was part of the marketing around it. And I think part of the business idea was like, you can take a photo with your camera and be part of it. They were trying not to be exclusive to DSLRs, although a lot of DSLRs had that data on it. I mean, mine has it as well. So it's like, so it's, th there is a bias there, you're right. Um, I don't know if it has profound ramifications for what we're surfacing. Um, quite honestly, because the amount of geotagged images, I don't know, it's a good question what percentage of geotagged images have XF, GF, XF long lat data and come from DSLRs, but I, I don't think it's gonna change the method much because like for example, in the favorites walkthrough I showed you, there was, we weren't even looking for that. We were just looking at how the community patterns were working. So, so, so um, this talk is very much an iSchool talk because you're sort of talking about the, the reality and then how it's negotiated and how we understand the reality socially, how people and communities negotiate it. Um, and you've done this, and I even think your Amazon Turk example sort of tells us that, that certain people can't evaluate certain photos because of their knowledge and context. But so if you wanted to take what you've learned here and think about it in another domain besides photos, can you extend it to something else that we do, you know, as social scientists or researchers? And if we're looking at is it true for text? Is it true for quantitative data? How would you handle that? So, I mean, so you, you could, I think the, the, for broader community systems work, uh, I think there's some probably, there are some areas to move into, like think about things like, like Wikipedia as a community system, for example, right? I think that's certainly there. I think the, um, the area I've been focused on has been around primarily, I don't see it primarily around photos, but reifying media objects, I think. So it's like been like, you know, there's videos here, but there's a chat, right? There's a Twitter stream, but there's a TV, right? So the sort of idea of like you, the old term of user generated content, um, but more so the, the conversations and the structure of how people deal and curate that information and, and sh I think so the, I guess the social online bits are, is where it starts. Um, moving to other domains gets interesting, but that's actually why the example for, and not by photos, it's a shift to say, looking at camera trap data. Because now we're talking about sensing, right? It's broadly sensing. It's not necessarily, there's not a lot of social information. It's an infrared camera trap in, in Africa somewhere, right? But there's other signals. We start to look at those other signals. And I think towards what's happening with urban spaces as well like the city of san francisco is well instrumented has a lot of data but what are the questions they're trying to solve with that data i'm not sure yet eric and i can talk about that but then uh can users people's behaviors like around photos or other uh, other uh, online sites help support answer those questions so You know, and we don't have the kind of um, data that we have on mm -hmm. but people mind 
text and they pull words out and think it signifies something that's absent the context. It's you know it's the community and the social world that it exists in and the time that it exists in. The Kindle, the highlighting. Yes, so the Kindle would be a good place to look at that. That's a great idea. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So let's say that you were the uh, the editors uh, that you talked to before, uh, and you were looking to assemble uh, or put together a tool that would allow you to uh, kind of curate photos uh, for aesthetic quality, and it was uh, they were looking for an off the shelf solution. Does something like that exist? And or or you know, are these uh, you know is, is programmatic kind of like uh, filtering of photos only really uh, you know possible vis-a-vis -vis these kind of custom custom projects if you will so <clears throat> you can and I know people who are trying this make classifiers to judge photo aesthetics however it's kind of tricky because you're assuming that there is a set of photos which are representative of aesthetic and other photos which are not representative of aesthetics right and so you can build various aesthetic classifiers for various things like you want like a good depth of field right so the blurred background and like sharp focus but that's that's one descriptor and so the way these things work especially modern computer vision systems so this idea of binary classification so i imagine one might could build an army of different aesthetically trained classifiers um i don't know exactly how that would work just yet because i can't even see the ones trying to get at in the first case i mean the thing is like <clears throat> usually you need something which is characteristic which is like a like a low level feature and i think aesthetics happens at a bit high level so it's it's a huge research question and at the same time i think there's a lot of value to editors and the diversity of aesthetics that a team of editors would generate that would be really hard to capture. So I'm not going to say it's totally impossible, but I'm saying for now the humans are winning. So. <laughs> Thanks for an interesting talk. I, I was intrigued by it, and I wasn't quite sure what you were using it for, the example of the Internet Archive. Uh, what seems intriguing there in terms of, for instance, Anna's question is here you have an enormous corpus of pictures, but that come with a startling amount of metadata. Uh, you, you have often the name of the painter or engraver or photographer, you have a caption, you have the page number of the book, the number of, I mean, did mm -hmm. they just leave all that behind? No, it's all there. Well, if that's there then, I mean, what does that, in some sense, say to the kind of tagging that you're trying <coughs> to do versus the conventional tagging? So my, my, my point in that example <coughs> is actually not about tagging. It's about navigation, well, um, well, and, and, about navigation? and as we, if you look at systems that do photo work, you know, it's like, what do they do? It's like, well, there's like the iPhotos and, and, and Adobe Lightrooms that help you do this desktop class, you know, desktop navigation and organization, things like Google Photos and Flickr, and, and then Dropbox is really good at doing cold storage of these photos. And it's like, there's all these ways that we are building these photo archives none of them have particularly anything to do with sort of heightened library or scientific examples, right? And so my point is we've, we can navigate a lot of the spaces, we can talk about all the social features, we can show you everything I just showed you. There's a huge missing area here, which is for these smaller data sets that are gonna get lost uh, or until they get resources to, for people to look at them and think about how do we navigate this? How do, how do we enter it? You know, and they have, a, they have a search index on their site so you can go and like search the books, the text of the books. You can search Flickr on the targeted on their on their photos and search for beards and get photos of beards or butterflies. Um, and it, that's actually beautiful to see the classifiers break. I think if you search for a bicycle, you get photos or drawings of old timey cars that had those big wheels that look like bicycle spokes on them. Right? So that, that's a, a bit of fun thing we've been doing. But like the real question there was, there's a lot more to photo collections than what's happening in sort of like you know, shutters that from consumer cameras, but most of it is, most of the research and most of the attention happens on those personal cameras and those shutter cameras that we're carrying around. And I'm just trying to highlight there's interesting information, there's interesting photos with deep structured data that we have yet to start to 
look at in a, in a good research way because even myself have been focused on the social signals yeah. to analyze questions. So part of my question was really, yeah, though, what, what do you think will happen if you carry, as it were, your methods over into a highly structured? <coughs> so that's, and this came up earlier, I forget who I was talking to, but like <laughs> the, the, the problem there is we don't know what the questions are. And so what we're trying to do is chat with and we, we, are, we are discussing with some of these agencies about what are those questions, what do they, or even if, what are the questions you are hoping scientists or people entering this library will ask, right? And we want to think about that first. We want to be, again, human-centered first, and then think about the tools that we can build to support those questions versus tools to support the data set. So I'm sorry I don't have an answer just yet. It's kind of late breaking, so we'll see. Watch this space. <laughs> Ian over here. So. Did, did um, any of the editors use the uh, interestingness ranking in Flickr to surface uh, good photos? Interestingness, um, I, I, um, knowing deeply how it works, I can say it doesn't work well for this, for this problem. Um, because you have to have a certain level of social tractability on site uh, and so interestingness will surface a lot of photos from a minority of people who have a lot of social traction on site. Got it. Right? And they were trying to find something else. Uh -huh. right? They were trying to find all those other photos. right? Because they wanted more diversity. They wanted more people. So maybe you could so, use it as a negative, <laughs> the least interesting. Don't, it doesn't quite work that way. But, <laughs> um, okay. but we were looking for other signals. And so one thing is, again, the, the, the insight here, one of the insights here was People are great at discovering media on site, so why don't we just look at their discovery patterns and mm. try to surface what gets lost? Mm. And so that was what was going on. Mm. Great. Uh, this is really interesting. Uh, also, I, my question is more that you used photographs for a lot of uh, sort of to extract a lot of information, a lot of kind of insights. And I'm curious what other, like how you could use that same medium to do other things. It has, has constraints on it. Like I, my thought was you could imagine using this to come up with where are bike racks in the city or where are there kind of other ways to navigate or where are there um, just other insights that people might care about. And the, the other part is the talk sort of, was this tension between using uh, sort of the crowd to help you and then some highly trained experts, these editors, mm -hmm. and then some computational methods. And you must have some insight from going through this path as sort of where you sort of feel the, the, the right direction is to really pursue. Is it really to lean more on the crowd for these or these sort of trained experts or really revisit computational <coughs> methods for something like this? No, it's like two part question. But okay. What was the first question again? The first we, one was just find places the first one was just you <laughs> used it largely. You used it for this weather kind of tool. Uh, that's, that's the first description you told us about. Mm -hmm. I know there's another. But I'm, I'm sort of referencing that. Yeah. So and that works well, but I'm wondering if along the path you thought there's a lot of other things we missed. There's some missed opportunities of other things we could have discovered or we could have um, leveraged. I know it was probably wasn't what. Yahoo wanted to do, or what it wasn't what they wanted to do at the time, but things that you thought were really insightful during that journey. Discovered in the photos, or? What other, like using or the photos to, I don't know, I'm even looking at this for like <coughs> fine trails, or, you know, it's obviously Giza, it's a sort of, just things you could imagine crowdsourcing or something beyond weather, okay. I guess. Um, let me answer the, the second part and then the first. <clears throat> to, to that um, point, the second part of the question, it's really where I like to push the most is on the community signals and the people, right? And how people understand the media and how they're dealing with it. And that's really where I want that signal. Now those people can be the consumers on site or they could be some trained experts, which in this case was editorial. And actually it was both in the example I showed you. And then we went to sort of some computational techniques of like this simple Markov network and then some computer vision. But really, it started with looking how human judgments were being made. But they weren't human judgments, and you use the word crowd, and I've been trying not to use that word because crowd has that other annotation of like, you know, disconnected mechanical Turk workers. Looking at 
the community of people, the, the people are there favoriting squirrel photos because they love squirrels. They're not getting paid to do it. It's just like, they're just, they're just doing it. And this is like an amazing thing. And so surfacing those patterns and surfacing how people are, are interacting and behaving and getting the information they want, the photos they want, and the interactions they want is really interesting to me. And then using that versus top down, we're just gonna classify a bunch of weather things and then run it through 10 billion photos and hand those over. I think there's, there's a bit of a subtlety and a bit of a quality change that happens. And I think the tension that you see comes a lot from people who think they can probably solve it just with vision, right? Um, and again, I'm not against that idea. I think it can happen right. But the thing is, you're gonna get a certain type of aesthetic, whoever's asking that question. You're gonna get a certain, it's, it's not gonna be something that we know the community has curated or has favored in a certain way. So doing aesthetic classification, it'd be really neat to look at interestingness as a community signal to train what's actually aesthetically judged by this, by this set of people. Because I'm pretty sure on Instagram it would be manifesting totally different. So I always try to start with the community and see how that connects and supports the technology versus going to the it's like heavyweight, you know, don't throw the Hadoop cluster at it first. See what people are doing in the first place. To the, to the other question, um, I think a lot of the, the other sides of it is what feeds some, some of those other questions are what feeds the, some of the research you saw, like the clocks, like looking at clocks around the world and, and what do they say and using that as a ground truth. I think those research questions, they happen along the way. Um, you know, we've not actually tried to make any detectors that are particularly like, you know, bike, bike detectors would be really interesting. It's like, you know, you, there's, we have a lot of questions around urban data that, that we're hoping to investigate um, by using sensors, again, like from the city, coupled with what we know for where photos are being taken. And I think that will sort of drive it. But as far as um, this example of, of retrieving photos around weather, we've kind of stuck on that one for, for now. We did try an experiment to, to see if we can get photos for editorial, for, for photo editorial, for like, you know, licensing, right? Um, and that was quasi successful because then it wasn't we're looking for photos, we're looking for photographers. And so we tried to take the same model and then see if we could surface people on site versus photos. And that became a harder question and we're still trying to figure out exactly what's the right flow there. but that will tend to probably look at favorites more because, but they were going to serve as a clique of people who are known, people who know other photographers on sites. And the thing is, and the problem is, the editorial uh, licensing, those people, they know how to do that already very well. And so can we help them do the job better, not just replace it? And that's, that's what we're looking for. So. Sure. This, this is totally just a clarifying thing that I don't yeah. understand because uh, this crowd issue, which I, I understand why you, you're sort of trying to disambiguate this sort of community versus crowd issue. Maybe I just didn't understand how the system actually worked because I viewed it as there was this issue of aesthetics that you kind of mentioned, like, oh, we have to have the right aesthetic quality so of photos. But I viewed it as, is it maybe more about recognizability? Like you want these places so that if we show these photos, we go, that's Paris, that's London, that's my neighborhood. And I thought it, the resolution was finer scale. I could be, this is Potrero Hill, and that I would be recognizing these, and I would be, the crowd would be residents of Potrero Hill. I Maybe mean, I just didn't yeah, understand that's how it was a, That's a very good point. Uh, and yeah, you, you do want what is iconographic for a region, like London, what's, a, what's an iconographic picture of London? And that's the ones you want to bring back. but. That's if you're broadly serving London, but if you want to get all the neighborhoods in London right, then what's iconographic? I don't know what's iconographic about Noe Valley, and I've lived there for a long time, <laughs> okay? Unless it's a stroller and a dog. I'm not really <laughs> sure what would be the iconographic photo, but that's kind of what they wanted. But what we're talking about is these broader weather photos and how they intersect with what's iconographic. And I think that's where the editors really could sort of control and steer and that's, I think, why the editors always wanted to be in the loop, because they didn't really know how to classify that. And we might be able to look at the community to start to understand what London looks like, right? And I think that's easy to do, but we're not going to get all of London. We're going to get like the, the, the top tourist spots. Um, and so I think 
starting, and I think maybe with the geo-positioning work and the compass data, we can start to understand where these points are, points of interest across the city, right? But this goes to the sort of longer research question versus a business team is asking us to solve a problem. And so, and it, what's nice is we try to do both at the same time and we try to keep traps and progress on these harder questions as they come up. And hopefully eventually they'll fold back in, but not for a while. It takes, takes some time to get there, so. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone.